بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. Welcome again to a new episode of Islam 101, where we deal with the basic fundamentals of Al Islam and explaining the tenets. And today we're going to continue what we began in our previous three episodes. And we're dealing today again with the Hadith of Gabriel, the Hadith of Jibril. And we've arrived at this point to the discussion that's centered around Al-Qadr, the divine decree. In our last episode, we left off by saying the statement of the Hibr, or the Habr of the Ummah, of this Ummah, of this nation, Abdullah ibn Abbas. They call him the Hibr, meaning the ink of this Ummah, because he was knowledgeable and he was busy with teaching. And they call him the Habr as, as well, which means he's like from the ulama, the scholars, the Rabbaniyin, those tremendous scholars. Abdullah ibn Abbas, after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was like the rest of the companions. He began to teach the tabi'un, those people who came after the companions. He was a scholar and a teacher in Medina, and then he went to Mecca. So he had many students who the Muslims should come to know. Mujahid, Qatada, and other than them, they used to ask him questions. And they said to him one time, Ya Abdullah ibn Abbas, what about the Qadr? We want to know about the Qadr. In one narration he said, Al-Qadru Sirullah. The Qadr is Allah's secret. He hasn't shared that with all of us. He didn't tell us all of the details about the Qadr. He left the knowledge of it with him. In another narration he said, the Qadr is a dark street. Don't go down it. So I ask you, if you came to where I come from, the area in the East Coast in America, in New York, somewhere like that, and there was a dark street, an alleyway, would you, would you, Sardar, would you walk down a dark street, an alleyway in the mean streets of New York City? No, of course not. That's the answer. Of course not. Well, delving into the Qadr and this issue and trying to deal with it and know all of the details is more dangerous than that. I prefer to go down a dark street in New York City than to try to figure out the details of the Qadr because there are certain things that we just were not meant to understand every angle of it. And that is what faith is all about. Al-Iman. You just have to believe it. As it relates to Al-Qadr, the divine decree, some people came to Abdullah ibn Umar, radiyallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. They said, Ya Abdullah ibn Umar, we come from a place in Kufa, in Al-Iraq, our Iraq, our Iraq, the place Iraq. There are some people there who are good students and they're reading about the religion and they believe in their religion, but they deny the Qadr. They deny this belief in the Qadr. There are people who are saying, they're using their minds, how is it that Allah could write down that a person would die on disbelief? How is it that Allah will cause an airplane to f crash and 30, 300 people die? How is it that someone can hijack a car in New York. That means they get in the back seat with a gun and they shoot the lady and shoot her kid. How is that? Why would Allah do such a thing? Why? How? We don't believe in this. We don't believe in the Qadr. We don't believe Allah knows what's going to happen until it happens. Whoever says that Allah doesn't know what's going to happen until it happens, he's saying that Allah is jahil. Allah is ignorant. But in Al-Islam we say no. Allah is alim. Allah is khabir. Allah is all of that which necessitates him being the Khaliq, the one who knows everything. He knows every single thing. So when Abdullah bin Umar heard that, he said, I want you to go back and tell those people that I'm free from them and they're free from me. And Allah will not accept from them any of their deeds until they believe in Al-Qadr. And then he told them the hadith that his father narrated, the hadith of Jibril that we're dealing with here today. So that was the understanding of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as it relates to the Qadr. And that's what is up to us to understand. Right now, I have 100 pounds, British pounds in my pocket right now, 100. I'll give it to you, 100 pounds. Right now, if you can tell me what did you have for dinner yesterday before I count to 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He doesn't know. And most people don't know. They're going to have to figure it out. 
and you're the closest person to yourself and you don't know what you ate for dinner yesterday, but you want to come today and deal with the qadr and say, I don't accept, I don't, la. You don't even know what you ate yesterday. So how do you think you've been equipped to deal with the secret that Allah has kept with himself? He said in the Quran, just so that the person can't say, and he hides behind the qadr. He does something bad. He drinks khamar and he says, Allah made me do it. It was written before I did it. Ha! Huh. Allah said in the Quran, Alam naj'al lahu aynayn wa lisanun wa shafatayn wa hadaynahu najdayn. Did we not create for the human being and we gave him two eyes and we gave him a tongue and we gave him a lip, two lips and we guided him to the two ways, right and wrong? So everyone has the ability to say, I'm going to do right and I'm going to do wrong and no one's going to say, there was a force behind me pushing my head and he was making me do that evil. Not even Iblis, not even Satan, not even Shaitan. Shaitan can do nothing except make whispers. He can only whisper. He can only whisper. So we have total and absolute control over what we do. And we have a free will that was given to us by Allah. But Al-Qadr is something that we have to believe in it. Just as Rasulullah's companions believed in it. So we want to stop here concerning the Qadr. If you guys, you brothers, have any questions. Yeah, I got a question about Qadr. Uh, if I was created for something, how can Allah punish me for doing so that? He said, if he was created for something, how is it possible that if he was created to disbelieve, how could and how would Allah punish him? That doesn't seem to be fair. That doesn't seem, seem to be just. Again, I'm not going to sit here and try to rationalize the explanation to that. The Qadr is the secret of Allah. He is not unjust in what he has written down. Everyone is going to get what they deserved. Everyone is going to do what they were created to do. And Allah ultimately is the one who's going to judge those issues. And he is all just and he is all fair. This is our religion and that's something that we believe in. And that's why Abdullah ibn Abbas, and we take him as one of the examples. That's why he said what he said. Because in this issue, it's like dealing with an atheist. The atheist can continuously argue with you and say, prove to me that God exists. You say, look at the heavens, look at the earth, look at the moon, look at the water, look at all of this, what's going on? He says, but show me God. Where is God? You will never be able to show him God. No matter how much you try, no matter what your argument is, there comes a point where that person just has to believe. And this is similar to that. This is similar to that. Anyone else have any more questions? I got a question. Now, what I'm, about the people who, who never heard of Islam? What about the people who never heard of the religion of Al-Islam? That's a good point as it relates to the Qadr because Prophet Muhammad told us that there are four people who will be tested Yom Al-Qiyamah on the last day. The first person is the child who was born and then he died when he was young. The Prophet never came to him. He never heard the message. Another person is the man who became so old that he became senile. So the Prophet didn't come to him when he was in the state of senility. The third one is the person who is dumb. He was tried with being created in a way that he didn't have the ability to understand what people were saying. And the fourth one is the one who was crazy. Yom al -Qiyam on the last day, Allah will have a fire lit for them, a great massive fire, and Allah will say to those people, jump into the fire. Those from amongst them who jump into the fire and they obey Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, they will find the fire will be cool. Those people who don't jump into the fire and they disobey, Allah is going to say to them, had I sent my messenger to you, you would have disobeyed my messengers. So they will have the imtihan. They will have the test, Yom al qiyamah They will be tested by the fire being kindled. So that is what will happen. Those people who never heard the religion of Islam, they will be tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which brings me to an extremely critical point for my Muslim brothers and sisters. We have a responsibility to give da'wah ilallah. Give da'wah to Islam. Rasulullah said, tell the people about me even if it's only one ayah. That's why I'm honored to be here today. I feel that this is an honor to be given this opportunity to try my best to make people understand and know what Al-Islam is saying. 
So if you are a person who you don't know much about Islam, you may not be able to articulate Islam. No one is saying come to a studio and do what we're doing. Go to your local masjid and do the Friday sermon. No one is saying that's your responsibility. But you have to give da'wah to Allah. You have to call to Allah in your behavior. If you are a Muslim, the non-Muslims are looking at us and they're saying, if Muhammad was such a good man, then why are you a thief? And why are you a liar? And why are you doing this? And why are you doing that? So we have to make da'wah to Allah. When I came to this country, this country that I'm in right now, this is a Muslim country, when I was traveling here, certain women wore hijab, other women didn't wear hijab. Certain men were smoking, other men weren't smoking. Certain men were praying, other men weren't praying. So what we do is we send mixed signals to the non-Muslims. The non-Muslims don't know. Should they be wearing hijab or not wearing hijab? Should they be smoking or shouldn't they not be smoking? If Muhammad was such a good guy, such a good man, then why are you Muslims giving this particular picture of him? So I say that to my Muslim brothers and sisters. You have a responsibility to call non-Muslims to al-Islam. And I say to the non-Muslims, when you look at the Muslims, there are good Muslims and bad Muslims, just as there are good Christians and bad Christians, good Jews and bad Jews. Don't look at the Muslims as the example, necessarily. You have to do what Jibril did in the Hadith of Jibril. He came and he said, Ya Muhammad, you are the symbol and the example. I'm going to ask you. You have to look at Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as the example. Because people are on different levels as it relates to their understanding and their commitment to the religion. So it's not an excuse that the Muslim did this and he didn't do that. And Allah knows best whether or not the person who uses that as an excuse will be able to get a chance. Allah will forgive him or not. Allah knows best. But we all have to be careful as it relates to giving dawah to Allah. Calling people to the religion of Islam, even if it's only one eye. We're going to take a break here, and then we'll come back, inshallah, to deal with the issue of al-ihsan. And it's almost the end of this particular hadith, this tremendous hadith. And we ask Allah to make it all successful and all good for all of us. Islam 101. Bismillah. Welcome back to what is the very last episode and segment to our series in the discussion and the explanation of the Hadith of Jibril. And as we've mentioned so many times in the past in the previous episodes, this is Islam 101 in which we're trying to do our best to give a concise and a crystal clear understanding of the basic tenets and prescripts of the religion of Al-Islam. As it relates to the last aspect of this hadith, and much can be said, is the third level of the existence of the Muslim, and that is Al-Ihsan. And the one who possesses Al-Ihsan, or perfection, he is on the highest level of existence. The first level is Al-Islam. He's a Muslim. He's taking care of the five pillars of Al-Islam, or he at least believes in them. And he knows to leave any of them alone and to be negligent in any of them is a serious issue. And then the next level, a little higher than that, on the next higher stage and level is Al-Iman, where he is a mu'min. And now we come to the highest stage, perfection, Al-Muhsin, Al-Ihsan. The Prophet has ordered us to have Ihsan in everything, to have perfection. He said in an authentic hadith, Verily Allah orders you people with perfection. So if you do something, do it very well. If you slaughter an animal, slaughter it well. Take the knife, he said, and make sure that you sharpen it so as to spare the suffering to the animal. That's what our religion says to us as it relates to the food that we're going to eat. That we don't take a blunt instrument and cause the animal to suffer. We have to have ihsan. 
You have to sharpen it so that in one or two goals, and when you st strike the juggler vein on the neck, the animal is, is relieved from any suffering. If al Islam has ordered us with ihsan, perfection, in the way we slaughter a rabbit, a bird, a chicken, then what do you think would be the case in the religion as it relates to al ihsan, perfection, and being a brother? Perfection and trying to call people to Islam. Perfection and being a husband, being a wife. What do you think our religion will say as it relates to perfection and dealing with non-Muslims? Then, of course, this is more important than a bird or another one of these small animals like a rabbit. So he, in this hadith of Jibril, when he was asked, what is ihsan? What is perfection? He said, perfection is you should worship Allah as if you see Allah. Right now, you brothers are looking at me right now. The audience, they see me right now. As a result of the eyes being trained upon me, I'm going to act a particular way. I'm going to act a certain way. I'm going to behave a certain way. It's like the CCTV, the camera, the closed circuit TV. If you know that the camera is on you, the person is never going to steal from the store. If he knows the camera is on them, as I've seen certain people who work in restaurants, they have to put a camera in the area where they're cooking the food because some of the workers throw things inside of the food because they don't like their job. But if they know that the camera is on them, they're not going to do that. Well, that's what Ihsan is, that you worship Allah and you act and believe as if he sees you. And even though, as if you see him, and even though you don't see him, you know for a fact that Allah sees you. So that means that the Muslim doesn't allow himself to be found by Allah in a place where he shouldn't be. He shouldn't allow himself to be found or seen by Allah in a condition that he wouldn't allow other people to see him. And in an authentic hadith, the Prophet told us to have hayat, to have modesty and shyness. He said, have shyness of the people, have shyness of Allah the same way you have shyness from the religious man from amongst you. So if there's a man who is known for his being religious, we're going to act a certain way. Those of us who smoke, and smoking is a terrible crime, and it's a sin, and it's haram. I know people who smoke, and they're trying to kick the habit, who at the age of 40, they still don't smoke in front of their parents out of respect. They don't want to see, allow their parents to see them smoking. So this is similar to the issue of al ihsan as it relates to Allah that a person behaves in a way in which he feels that he sees Allah. And even though he doesn't see Allah, he knows that Allah sees him. And as a result of that, he curtails his behavior and he behaves in a way that is showing that he is conscious of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah most high, is viewing him. Finally, as it relates to the hadith of Jibril, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made mention of some of the signs of Yom al Qiyam, of the last day. And one of those signs is what was mentioned concerning the Arabs competing with each other, the money and the opulence that Allah has given the Arabs, where they can make the buildings that they have and they're competing with each other. One of the things of this hadith that I want to make mention with you from the signs is that there are many signs that he told us about. And we'll deal with them as time goes on. But one of the things that this hadith goes to show, it goes to show the impermissibility of Muslims competing with each other where they're wasting money and they want people to look at them. Why do the people build the big buildings like that? So that they can say, look how much money I spent on that building. So that the architect, the one who designed the building can say, look, my design is better than your design. And there are people who need, from our ummah, from our nation, who need that money more than that building going up into the sky. That's not the way of Al-Islam. Islam doesn't have anything against building nice buildings. The math that goes behind building, the technology that goes behind and inside of the building is from our religion. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's when we waste money and we start to compete with each other at the expense of what is more important than that. So we say, as a revert, I say this as a revert, that the Arabs in this hadith were mentioned specifically because the Arabs are supposed to be an example for the ummah of Muslims. It is their language. The people sitting here, most of us don't speak Arabic. So we can't pick up the Quran and just understand the Quran. 
the Arabs have a responsibility to make da'wah to al-Islam and to be examples for the good and not examples that are for what is not acceptable or what is evil. So that is, in a nutshell, so to speak, the explanation and some of the benefits of the hadith of Jibril. There are other things that could be said, but because we're going to mention these issues, inshallah, in the future, in more detail in the future episodes, we didn't get all the way deep, deep into all of the issues again because it's what? Islam 101. Islam 101. We want to make it where it is easy on the palate, easy on the mind, and we ask Allah to make it easy for us. So if you brothers have any questions today or for the last part of the segment, feel free. Yes. There are people who say, La ilaha illallah, no God but Allah. What about them? What, what should we call them? Are they Muslims? Are they. They say there's no God but Allah? Mm hmm. Uh, if they say no God, there's no God but Allah, yes, they're Muslims if they also understand La ilaha illallah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and they take the rest of the pillars of Al-Islam, they're Muslims. It's just that that's a faulty in the translation, that's all. There are other gods other than Allah, as we mentioned. Jesus is a God, money is the God. In India, they have over 365 gods, a God for every day of the week, every day of the week in India. And some of their gods uh, that they worship are funny gods, like worshiping monkeys, worshiping cows. I've been to India, and we were in traffic jam for two hours because the cow sat in the street. And the people didn't want to tell a cow to move because they believed it was God. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when mankind is left to his own vices and his own understanding and his own interpretation. The cow is God. Is that possible? That the monkey is God? No, this is not possible and it's not befitting. So they are Muslims, but it's not the correct explanation or translation of La ilaha illallah. And that's why when Rasulullah Muhammad came to the Arabs of Quraysh, they knew the language very well. So when he said to those people, say La ilaha illallah, they knew right away what it meant. They knew La ilaha illallah means there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. So therefore, that means that the gods that we have around our Kaaba, La ilaha illallah means that these gods don't deserve to be worshipped, which entails mean we're going to lose our economic foothold here. The people who come from Sham, they come from Syria and Jordan and that area. They used to go to Mecca to trade. In the summer they go here, in the winter they will go there. So in the winter time, the people of Syria in that area, they will come to Mecca. And they would trade, and they would give money for the gods. So the people with Rasulullah would make a lot of money. And then they will go back. So la ilaha illallah, as soon as the Quraysh heard that from Rasulullah, they knew la ilaha illallah meant what? There is no God worthy of worship but Allah. So this doesn't deserve to be worshipped. Allat and Al-Uzza and Manat, they don't deserve to be worshipped. They're false gods. So that means we're going to get hit in our pocket financially. They understood that concept. Today, unfortunately, if you ask an Arab in Arabic, what does La ilaha illallah mean? He'll say, there's no God but Allah in Arabic. That's because the Muslim ummah, the nation, we have to get back to the basics of the religion. Which brings me to another point, and that is, in these episodes, you would have witnessed that I use a lot of Arabic terms. I've been told over and over again that I have to be careful and cognizant of not using terms because I can't take it for granted that the Muslims know the terms, nor can I take it for granted that the listeners, whether they're Muslims or not, can understand what I'm intending from the content of what I'm saying or the context in which I'm saying it in. So I first want to apologize. I should try al-ihsan and be a perfect example in what I'm saying, but sometimes I forget. So I want to apologize, first of all. Second of all, we'll do our best to come back to try to explain what this term is and what that term is, and we'll try to stay away from the Arabic terms altogether. But for my Muslim brothers and sisters, the religion of al-Islam is a religion that was revealed in the Arabic language. And it was revealed in Arabic for some wisdom that's with Allah. And one of the wisdoms is the Arabic language is a precise language in the way that it is. It is an eloquent language. It is the last book for you to know what Allah is wanting and commanding. So 
everyone has to make an effort to learn as much Arabic as he can possibly learn. And this is one of the signs that I saw that convinced me that El Islam was the truth. That if you take the average Muslim off the street, and the majority of Muslims are not Arabs. Arabs are a minority. Take the Muslims from Africa, Indonesia, and you ask them, give me all of the words that you know in Arabic. You will see that he knows a thousand words. He may not be able to speak Arabic fluently and put those words into sentences, but he knows a lot of the original language of Muhammad, the last prophet and Nabi. Whereas, if you ask the Jew or if you ask the Christian, tell me 15, 20 words that Jesus spoke, the Aramaic of Jesus, he's not going to be able to tell you 10 words. He's going to claim he believes in the Bible, but he doesn't know any words of the original language that Jesus spoke. That is a clear sign that things were lost along the way in that Bible. Some of them even think that the Bible was revealed in English. No, Jesus spoke Aramaic and Moses spoke Hebrew. And the majority of the people who connect themselves to those two religions, they don't know either language. Whereas the normal Muslim, wherever you find him, I know Muslims who are in Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska. They're Eskimos. Eskimos. They know words in Arabic, a thousand Arabic words. This is one of the signs that Al-Islam is the religion of truth. Do you brothers have any more questions concerning the hadith of Jibril? Any more? Muhammad. About, about Al-Ihsan. Uh, if, the, if the motive behind the man that he does not smoke in front of his dad is a fear of him, is that called Al-Ihsan? As it relates to fearing the human beings and being in a position where you don't want them to see you doing something that's wrong, that is a part of Ihsan, and that's from our religion. But we should fear Allah, the ultimate fear. We should fear Allah, the ultimate fear. We're going to stop here with this hadith of Jibril, this most important hadith in the religion of Al-Islam. And we ask Allah to accept this effort from us and to make it easy so that you could and would have understood what our intent and our goal was behind in explaining this particular hadith. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyin al-ameen wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in wa salam ala min ittaba al-huda. Islam.